The first bombardment destroyed half the world's major cities in one strike. New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, all gone, in the blink of an eye. There was barely even any rubble, just mile after mile of ash. It wasn't like in the old movies, when flying saucers would show up in orbit and hang around for a while as the characters debated what to do. The Cowco launched their first attack from deep space, because in real life, things don't have to be fair. They didn't have to give us a chance to defend ourselves, so they didn't. They just sat well out of range of all our weapons and reduced our world to ruins. By the time we even saw what was shooting at us, hundreds of millions of people were dead. We didn't learn their name until much later. Cowco. It didn't sound like what the heralds of the apocalypse should call themselves. But real life lacks a sense of theater, too. It took us even longer to figure out anything else about them. That was another thing the old movies got wrong. The aliens usually looked like streamlined versions of humans. Two arms, two legs, one head. Maybe their skin was gray, or they had some extra ridges or were missing a nose, but it was always the same basic concept. We really didn't understand what the word alien meant back then. Even when we invented non-humanoid aliens, we tended to reference other Earth animals to describe them. Reptilian. Insectoid. Like an octopus or a squid, when we wanted to get really adventurous. The Cowco didn't have arms, legs, or even a head. Their appearance was, well, almost like a metal flower, eight petals covered in metallic scales that closed around a fleshly lump from which protruded a trumpet mouth. The mouth was surrounded by eyes and a cluster of tendrils they could use to manipulate things. They didn't have any of the more abstract human characteristics either, like mercy, empathy, or compassion. They eradicated our main population centers, then their vast harvest ships descended and began devouring the landscape. Some of them bored into the crust to extract rare minerals, but most of them seemed to be there to collect organic matter. Whole forests were swallowed by their machines, and in some places even the soil was stripped down to the bedrock. We tried to contact them. We tried to beg them to stop. After the first bombardment and the follow-up strikes that targeted the smaller cities and the refugee columns, we knew it was probably futile but we begged for our lives anyway. When that didn't work, we tried fighting back. The combined might of Earth's military forces was still mostly intact. It seemed like the Cowco hadn't bothered learning anything about us, so all their targeting had been based on hitting the biggest population centers. Perhaps they assumed we would concentrate our military resources there. Perhaps they were just trying to break our spirit. But most of our planes, ships, and missiles were still intact. Maybe they didn't bother targeting our military because they didn't think it could make a difference. First, we sent wave after wave of fighter planes against the harvesters. They were destroyed by ships that were sitting safely in high orbit. Missile strikes were completely futile, too. Everything that came within a few dozen miles of a harvester was shot down. We couldn't even get a nuke close enough to make any difference. There were a few attempts to trick the harvesters into ingesting a bomb but they must have had some kind of sensors to detect explosives because none of them ever detonated. Direct attacks simply didn't work. Millions of people were dying every day, either from the bombardment that was still ongoing or the effects of the collapse of all infrastructure and food distribution networks. We had to find some way to fight back, but we'd already thrown everything we had at them. Then someone pointed out that just because they wouldn't listen to us didn't mean we couldn't listen to them. There was nothing magical about their technology. It was much, much more advanced than ours, but it still worked on principles we understood. They even used radio to communicate, and the arrogant bastards didn't even bother to encrypt their radio traffic. The first breakthrough came when someone at CERN realized that certain sequences in their radio signals were a coordinate system. The Cowco had virtually ignored Switzerland. A few of the biggest European cities had been hit, but the aliens had concentrated most of their efforts to exterminate us elsewhere. Asia got hit the hardest, then North America. If they'd bothered to try and understand us, they might have realized that obliterating 10 million Chinese factory workers wouldn't matter half as much as eliminating our best scientific facilities. But they hadn't, and they didn't. So a lot of scientists had taken refuge at CERN's underground labs, and when one of them figured out the Cowco's coordinate system, with so many of humanity's best minds there to help it, wasn't long before they'd figured out a way to track the alien ships, which wasn't very useful at first. In fact, a lot of our remaining military thought they were wasting time that could be better spent developing new weapons. We already knew where their ships were, we just couldn't hit them. 
but once we had some kind of reference point, we could start translating their messages. For example, if a message was picked up that had coordinates for a spot in northern Michigan, and the next day a harvester showed up there and began tearing up the forest, we could start to piece together the words for harvester, move, and forest. They had hundreds of ships all over the world, sending thousands of messages a day. It didn't take us long before we had a basic lexicon and a rough idea of their grammar. And once we had an understanding of the fundamentals, we could design AI tools to help translate the rest. Soon, we knew exactly what they were saying to each other. That was how we learned they called themselves the Cowco. It was also how we learned that they didn't really think about us much at all. Most of the messages that weren't part of their traffic control system were still related directly to work, production quotas, harvesting schedules, quality of harvested material, and so on. But there was some chatter between the ships that was more like ordinary conversation. Their social structures were very different to ours. Particular groups of genetically related individuals were responsible for different areas of ship operations. One clan was responsible for maintaining the engines. One clan saw to the cargo bays. One clan acted as the commanding officers and so on. Most of their chatter was about the various groups jockeying for position within their ship and within the fleet hierarchy. Sometimes they talked about what was going on back home or what they were going to do when they returned. They barely mentioned us. In fact, one of the few times we cropped up in their discussions was when one of their ship's command groups queried whether it was worth expending time and energy exterminating any more of us. After all, we hadn't posed a threat so far. They were on schedule to strip the planet of all its natural resources in a few decades, which seemed to be a short time frame for them, and their projections didn't show what remained of us recovering enough to be any kind of problem. The main metric they seemed to use in how they judged what kind of resistance we could mount was industrial potential, which they used city size as a proxy for measuring, clumsy and based on a lot of faulty assumptions, but apparently economists are like that across the galaxy. They didn't hate us. They didn't even think we were a real threat. They planned the destruction of our entire civilization solely so we couldn't interfere with their production schedule, even for a day. And the extinction of our species, and almost every other living thing on Earth, was simply a byproduct of their extraction process. Even swatting a fly, you might feel a tiny twinge of guilt. They didn't. It was, well, it was literally an alien concept to them. If they'd put a little more effort into thinking about us, we wouldn't have stood a chance against them. They had almost all the advantages knowledge, ships, material. But we could do one thing they couldn't. We could understand the other side's point of view. People talk about empathy as if it's a positive character trait. It isn't. That is, it's neither good nor bad in and of itself. Empathy is simply an ability, and like any ability it can be used to help others. Or it can be used as a weapon. Once you know how someone else thinks, you know what their weaknesses are. The Kauko had two weaknesses. The first was that they were obsessed with completing their mission. The second was that they underestimated us. If they had been more cautious and less pressed for time, they might have started pulling harvesters out for repair when they started showing minor malfunctions in their internal systems. But why worry if an internal camera goes offline or fuel pressure drops in a secondary system? Wear and tear happens when you're out in the field, put it on the repair list and keep on harvesting. To be fair, the Cowco had every reason to be confident. There wasn't a convenient single point of failure, like a mothership. They hadn't taken any special precautions to protect themselves from us, but their general precautions were more than enough to stop us from getting any military hardware even close to them. And although their ships did share information, there was no overarching network that would obligingly update all their systems with a virus. At most, if we somehow figured out their technology enough to be able to do that, we might have been able to take out one or two ships that way before they realized what we were doing and took steps to stop us. Surprise was crucial. The moment they realized we could actually hurt them, they'd close whatever tiny crack in their armor that had allowed us to get through. But just because we couldn't use it to hurt them yet didn't mean we couldn't exploit the openings we found in other ways. Our first mission was to get people aboard the harvesters. We knew where the harvesters were going to be, and thanks to the efforts of the CERN team, we knew the access codes to open the outer hatches. The ships still in orbit would shoot down a plane before it got near, and they could detect and neutralize explosives and other weapons. But they would ignore a couple of humans, if they stopped harvesting every time they were about to run over some of the native wildlife they'd never get anything done. It still makes me queasy, thinking about what those infiltration teams had to do. 
The harvesters hovered more than a hundred meters off the ground. Aircraft were out, so they had to come at it from below, hit it with a magnetic grapple shot by a compressed air catapult, then climb up the line dangling in thin air. And that was the easy part. From there, they had to use magnetic clamps to climb 200 meters further up the side of the hull, all while the hurricane created by the harvester's intake valves was trying to tear them off the side. Once they were in, their job was to hide, hide, and learn. Fortunately, the internal atmosphere wasn't too different from ours, and the harvesters were crewed by only a handful of Kauko, who mostly stayed near the bridge. The harvesters were vast, almost a kilometer long. Once they'd worked out where the cameras were, the teams had no trouble moving around. It took a few days before they started reporting back. They didn't dare send any radio signals that might be picked up, so they put everything they'd learned into a flash drive and dropped it over the side, with a beacon that would activate once the harvester had moved on. Simple, elegant, extremely effective. The Cowco saw everything in terms of resources. They had more than us, so they were going to win. But often, you can do a lot with just a little. We knew their language and we knew how they thought. Now we had access to schematics for their technology, too. We could have started disabling the harvesters. A lot of people wanted to. They were doing so much damage to the planet. If we waited too long, the Earth would be stripped down to a lifeless rock. But if we disabled them, the Cowco would just repair them again. And even if we somehow destroyed them all, there were still the ships in orbit. The moment we revealed what we were doing, we'd never get another chance again. So instead, we used the schematics to work out how we could create malfunctions that looked like natural. In any industrial facility, there would be an attrition rate for components. Rather than doing anything spectacular, we just had to increase the rate of operational attrition. Close an intake chute while the harvester was ingesting, causing a clog that would take time to clear. Puncture a coolant line and flood one of the collection bins with chemicals, ruining the shipment. Introduce a bug into the monitoring software so that another of the collection bins was overloaded and burst. Our scientists got very creative in finding ways to screw with the Cowco's operations without giving our commandos away. All those malfunctions didn't stop the harvesters, but they did slow them down. The Cowco didn't care about humanity, but they did care about their schedule. They absolutely hated delays. The command hierarchies were increasingly sniping at each other over their perceived failures, and in turn, they were putting pressure on the engineering clans working under their direction. Our listening posts started recording increased communications traffic, and the translators were having a field day. It was clear that everyone in the Cowco fleet was becoming increasingly stressed and overworked. In other words, they were all distracted. It took a while before our infiltrators were able to get onto any of the ships in orbit. The main reason for this was that we had to figure out how to get into their communication system and make sure we could use it without them noticing. Because obviously once a team had left the planet, they couldn't communicate by flash drive anymore. The harvesters made regular trips back up to cargo ships in orbit. But until we worked out how to use the Cowco's radios, there was no point sending anyone on board them. But once we did, we began to spread. And the Cowco, too busy dealing with the multiplying delays, didn't notice as things started to go wrong on the cargo ships as well. Only small things, and the cargo ships were truly colossal several miles long, big enough to contain the resources of an entire planet. What did it matter if a tertiary system went down? It doesn't affect the schedule, so put it on the repair sheet and concentrate on making the harvesters fully operational again. If they had any time to think about anything but their schedule delays and increasingly backbiting recriminations resulting from that, they might have worked out that the malfunctions seemed to be spreading almost like a contagious disease. In fact, one of the Cowco command groups did notice that the cargo ship it was responsible for started experiencing malfunctions right after it docked with a harvester that had also been having serious problems. But because we could intercept their communications, we knew that they knew something was up, so we just told that infiltration team to back off. And with so much else going on, they forgot about it. Finally, we reached the critical point, the message we had been waiting so long to hear. One of the Cowco ships experienced a malfunction and requested an engineering team to help. And the rest of the fleet answered, No, we're too busy. This is your fault. This is your problem. Which meant we could start shutting down a ship's communication systems and no one would come check on them for a while. And once a ship's communication system was down, the crew couldn't call for help. The ships didn't really have internal security. There were cameras 
and bulkheads that could be sealed, but it had never really occurred to any of the Cowco that we might get that far, and even if by some fluke a few humans managed to get aboard, they wouldn't be able to get through the doors to the bridge before help arrived, unless they already knew the internal access codes, that is, and unless they could shut down the communication system so there was no distress call. The Cowco's technology might be incredibly powerful, but as individuals, they aren't all that formidable. Their metallic skin does give them a certain amount of durability, but not the kind that would stand up to a high-caliber bullet, and they aren't very mobile. When our infiltration team stormed the crew compartments, most of the Cowco died before they even realized what was happening. A few managed to seal themselves away on the bridge and call for help. But the call never went anywhere, and the doors only held for as long as it took the commandos to log into the ship's network on their newly updated iPads and disable the locks. And then... The ships kept performing their duties exactly as they had been before. We even knew enough to spoof their ordinary communications traffic. And because we'd taken the time to learn how our enemy thought, the Cowco bought it. The rest of the fleet had plenty of their own problems. No one was going to give it too much thought if someone didn't answer a personal message. They were probably just too overworked to have time to compose a response. One by one, the ships of the Cowco fleet experienced minor communication blackouts. First the harvesters, then the cargo ships. The trickiest ones were the escort ships, which was a problem because they were the ones with all the weapons. They didn't have a reason to regularly dock with other ships, and although they kept sending their engineering teams back and forth to keep on top of the malfunctions, the moment we took out one of those they'd get suspicious. They might be too busy to keep track of what was happening to other ships, but they would notice if one of their own teams stopped responding, and an inconsistency in our attempts to impersonate them might be noticed. The last stage of our plan was to create a major incident aboard one of the cargo ships, one that the escort ships would have to respond to. Because the cargo ships were so vast, it would take every engineer the other ships had if one of them developed a serious problem. In a crisis, shuttling them all back and forth would be too slow, and the fleet could not afford to lose one of the cargo ships. That wouldn't just hold up the schedule, that would reduce the resources they were able to go home with, which was absolutely not acceptable. So, one of the cargo ships had a little accident with its reactor. That really stretched the technical knowledge of our scientists. Cowco Tech was so advanced, there was still a huge amount that we didn't understand, but they managed to work out a plan that would convincingly fake a reactor overload without actually blowing the ship up. Seven of the forty escort ships responded. They duly docked with the cargo ship and sent their engineering teams aboard, heading for the areas our distress call had said were affected. Then they found themselves sealed behind bulkheads that wouldn't respond to their access codes and shut out of the comm systems. Our strike squads were on board the escort ships the moment the engineering teams were cut off. There was no resistance. Why would there be? Why station guards by an airlock when you're going to help another of your own ships? The commandos only had to get as far as the nearest computer terminal. Then they could hack into the communications, disable them, and head for the bridge. It was only minutes before the escort ship's comms came back online, messaging the rest of the fleet that radiation from the damaged cargo ship had temporarily caused minor damage to their comms that was now fixed, and every message was signed by a cowco that was already dead. From there, everything was relatively easy. The escort ships exchanged personnel a lot more frequently with each other than they did with the cargo ships and harvesters. One by one, we stormed them, massacred the crew, and sent out a message to the rest of the fleet saying everything was fine. Then we mopped up the last remaining cargo ships and harvesters. The result was a foregone conclusion for so long before we actually captured the last ship that it was almost an anticlimax. We captured the last of Cowco rather than killed them. I doubt they felt fortunate about that, since they were sent to the scientists, for study. Because if our victory was down to anything, it was that we understood who we were fighting, and the Cowco did not. We had saved the Earth. What was left of it? Billions were dead. Entire ecosystems destroyed. The world as we had known it before the Cowco arrived was gone, and we could never undo the damage they'd caused. But now we had the Cowco's technology. We had the knowledge to at least build something new amongst the ashes. Our problems weren't entirely over, though. Because the Cowco fleet would be expected home in a few decades. And if it didn't arrive, from what we could tell their response would simply be to send an even larger one to recover their assets and finish the job. That was the benefit of patience, though. 
we'd been able to capture their whole fleet rather than destroy it. And we saw no reason not to send it back to where it came from. There would be no more harvesting, of course, and what had already been collected would be returned to the planet it came from. But that was okay. We had decades to work out what we wanted to send back to their home, now that we knew where they lived. If you're a fan of Rick Wrights, the author of this story, he now has his own YouTube channel full of many more sci-fi stories. You'll find his channel link in the description. Please head on over and subscribe to his channel.